So even though any cell we could stain with the gram stain, right? Mainly we do a gram stain on bacteria because we want to know these basic structural differences that categorize a cell as being gram positive versus gram negative when we gram stain. So um, for bacteria, this is the, the structures you typically see for those results in the gram stain. So for gram positive, remember, they have a very thick cell wall. And what is this substance that makes up the cell wall in bacteria only? Peptidoglycan, right? A little bit of a tongue twister. Um, so it's made up of sugar. Remember, alternating sugars. Those are the blue and purple dots here. And then it's hooked together by amino acids. And then even additionally for gram positives, they have this tocoic acid. Almost acts as rebar to help support these many, many layers um, there is to this substance. So this is a very thick layer. And what happens to this layer in the gram stain that makes these cells stay purple? It shrinks. When does it shrink? Not the iodine stage. Remember, the iodine binds with what? What's the first stain we use? Crystal violet. And it makes a bigger molecule. What happens to the, so first step is crystal violet, right? What's the next step? Iodine. What's the next? Alcohol. Alcohol, the decolorizer, right? But in the case of gram positives, do they decolorize? No, why not? What happens to this layer? It shrinks, right? So those holes in between shrink up, and that crystal violet iodine, that much larger molecule complex now, gets trapped in and can't get out. So these cells stay purple even after decolorization. Unlike gram negatives, and the reason why you see the difference, that's weird, um, is because of this difference in the structure makeup of this cell. So t a typical gram negative, and I say typical because not all gram negatives look exactly like this. Um, there are obviously exceptions to rules, right? Um, but for the most part, they're going to have this outer membrane. And this is different from the cellular membrane, right? It has this outer leaflet, this outer portion that's not phospholipids like we're used to seeing in a membrane. It's lipopolysaccharide. And remember, this is what can be so dangerous for people with gram-negative infections, right? This part, unfortunately, is toxic to us. But because of this additional layer, this is really a benefit I'm going to clap because I was really depressed that you probably weren't going to make it this morning. <laughs> okay, so that outer membrane is um, a protective layer, right? And because of that, um, when the cells are alive, this is a really hard layer for stuff to get in and out of, right? So they have these really big protein complexes called porin proteins that literally can open up pores in that membrane layer so stuff can get in and out. Um, if they have a peptidolycan layer, it's sandwiched between these two membranes in what's called the periplasm. Um, it's a very thin layer of peptidoglycan. So when you think about the gram stain, again, we're going to stain them with crystal violet, right? And then what? iodine and then when we decolorize something interesting happens what happens to this these cell layers when we decolorize yeah actually the outer membrane is very much disrupted almost even completely removed um, so that layer is gone and then they have just if they, if any at all a very thin layer peptidoglycan is this enough to trap in that crystal violet iodine no. So they get washed out. They're clear at this point. So you can't see them. So what's the last step? We counterstain with saffronin, which is a red dye, right? But these guys have been damaged, so they don't hold on to a lot of the red dye. Just enough that you can see them, so they're a lighter shade of red that we refer to as being pink. So these structural differences come into play, too, when we talk about treatment, right? Penicillin can't get through. When these cells are alive, 
can't get through the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. That drug, that antibiotic produced by another microorganism, in this case a fungus, cannot get in to interfere with the mechanism of making that cell wall because that's how it works. It has to get inside the cell, bind to the proteins that are involved in the process of making the interbridges interbridges in between the layers of the sugars. So it can't, it can't be effective. Lysozyme, on the other hand, does affect peptidoglycan, but this is an enzyme, right? What does it do? What does lysozyme do? Where do we have it in our bodies? <coughs> Where? It's going to digest. It's an enzyme. It digests. It breaks apart molecules. Anyone know where it breaks apart the peptidoglycan? What bond it breaks? Nope. It attacks peptidoglycan directly. It breaks the sugar bonds. Right? It breaks apart those sugar bonds. Where in our body is it found? It's inside our cells, but there are two fluids, two secretions you produce that have high concentrations of this in it to help protect you. Your tears and, did you say the other one? Saliva, right? In your tears and your saliva. So again, it helps protect you from gram-positive bacteria that are in your environment, more so than gram-negative, because again, what's that coating of a gram-positive? It's all peptidoglycan, right? If you chew that up, What's going to happen to a cell when they don't have a cell wall anymore? They're going to die. Why? What is that cell wall? What's the function of that cell wall? Why even have it? Protection, but what kind of protection? Be more specific. All right, I'll give you a clue. Water. So they don't burst. Osmotic pressure, right? So when the water comes rushing in, right, they don't burst. So if their cell wall is damaged, either because they couldn't make it structurally sound because penicillin is in there interfering, or lysozyme ate away at their cell wall, what's going to happen to them? They're going to lyse. They're going to burst and die. So there's a whole genus of bacteria that don't actually have a cell wall. And because of that, the cell wall helps contribute to holding a particular shape. So these cells are referred to as being pleomorphic. This is all the same species. This is, um, I don't know why I want to say Klebsiella, different pneumonia. Um, mycoplasma pneumonia causes a very mild form of pneumonia, commonly referred to as walking pneumonia people are up walking around and they don't realize how sick they are um, so you run up about four flights of stairs and pass out at the top that's what happened to one of my friends and grads uh, when we were resident assistants and in, in uh, undergrad we decided during rounds that we would run up the stairs to the top she passed out on the top on me she had walking pneumonia couldn't breathe <laughs> right so um, with this one, if you think about it, right, they have no cell wall. So we going to give her penicillin? No, oh, it interferes with making a structurally sound cell wall. These cells have no cell wall, right? Hence why they don't hold a particular shape. So you've got to give other types of drugs, right? They're going to affect something, some other target in the cell to kill these bacteria. Good question, right? So the ne next thing you'll notice, it says sterols in the membrane account for the strength of the membrane, right? So this helps keep them from bursting. So we have sterol-like substances in our membranes too, because think about it, we don't have cell walls, right? We're not really usually under that much pressure, osmotic pressure like bacteria are, you know, and if we lost a cell, it wouldn't be the end of the world. We're a multicellular organism, right? We can afford to lose a few, right? Uh, but not not one, right? If you're a single-celled organism, you burst, you're dead. 
Uh, so, anyone know what the sterol-like substance that provides some rigidity to our membranes? Something we worry about in our blood work all the time, too. Cholesterol. Cholesterol. That's why when you eat animals, you get cholesterol, right? Because we naturally make it. And the bad news for some of us even, too, is because we naturally make it to put into our membranes and to convert into um, sterile drugs, uh, like the, a lot of the sterile-based hormones, right? They're all derived from cholesterol, testosterone, estrogen, things like that. We make this stuff. Okay. Unfortunately, some people are genetically programmed to make more than they need, right? So then it clogs up the arteries and creates problems. Or you eat too much of it. Or you do both, which is a bad idea. Right? The good news is what do we have to help you with this? <coughs> Medications. Medications, right? Um, but, you know, it could be a twofold factor. It could be genetic. It could be diet, right? Or it could be diet alone. That's a pretty easy fix for the most part. If you're not stubborn. Okay. <laughs> so remember, again, we kind of focus a lot on bacteria in the domain of um, archaea, though. They're also prokaryotes. Right? So most of these things that we've been talking about, we focus mostly on bacteria. Not to forget about archaea, which, again, are their own separate domain. The only thing they have similar to bacteria is that they're prokaryotic in nature, which means they lack what? They lack a nucleus. Um, they have a wide variety of cell shapes. Even some of them are square, which is kind of cool. Uh, Star-shaped, really kind of funky configurations. Um, but remember, again, although they do have shape, they do have a cell wall, it's not made of peptidoglycan. That's unique to bacteria only. So acid fast staining, very similar to gram staining in that it's another differential stain. But there's a reason why we do this particular stain. And in the name of the stain, it tells you a lot about what's going on. So this is a differential stain. So again, similar to gram stain, you're going to have a primary stain, you're going to decolorize, and you're going to have a counter stain. Right, you're going to have two different colors, and you're going to have a decolorization step in the middle. In this case, the decolorization step isn't just alcohol, it's acid alcohol. Hydrochloric acid, very strong acid. The organisms that stay stained with the primary stain, which is called carbofusion, this stain um, comes out like a purplish pink color, kind of what people refer to as fuchsia. Most people don't know what that means, right? But purplish pink color. And this really sticks to these cells. So much so that when you decolorize with acid in the alcohol, these guys stay stained. So they're said to be acid fast, meaning that they stayed like that. Not fast as in we run really fast, right? But as to um, maintain. So it's a definition of fast that's not very commonly used. Huh? It's kind of like steadfast, yes. Right? In that case, you're staying put, right? You refuse to move. In the same case here. It refused. So why does that happen? What's so special about some bacteria that this carbofusion stays stuck even with acid alcohol as a decolorizer? Well, when it applies to bacteria, there's actually a, a whole genus of bacteria called mycobacteria that have this property to them. And guess what cellular structure accounts for it? What made the structural, what made the color differences, what was the structure responsible for the differences we saw in the gram stain? Right, which are associated with what structure? The cell wall, right? So the cell wall for these guys, in addition to have peptidoglycan, they have this very waxy layer 
called mycolic acid. So as you can see in this picture, right, that color I was referring to, that reddish, purplish, pink color, that's the acid fast. And then any organisms that don't stay stained and get stained with the counter stain are what we refer to as non-acid fast. Now with this procedure, there's a couple of different methods that are used. Um, so different colors for the counter stain. Um, could be a blue, could be a green, could be almost a grayish color. <coughs> The important thing is it's not the carbofusion color, right? It's not this bright pinkish purple fuchsia color. So as far as bacteria are concerned, typically why we would do this stain is we're looking for this genus of bacteria. We're looking for mycobacteria. Mycobacteria have this specialized cell wall with this special substance known as mycolic acid. And then again, their name, remember myco, what does myco mean? Fungi, right? Um, and, and of course, they're telling you, no, it's not a fungus because they have bacteria in the name. Um, these guys are rods, but because of this very waxy um, cell wall component, they, um, in aqueous environments, they tend to clump together, right? Um, and so they get all clumped together and they almost look like uh, hyphae that you would see for mold, hence the, the myco part of their name. But you can see here some of them kind of separated from each other, right? And they are rods. So a lot of times you'll see the abbreviation AFB. It stands for acid fast bacilli because of the shape, that rod shaped. Anyone know some diseases that are caused by mycobacteria? Tuberculosis. And then one from biblical times, but we still have it today. Good old leprosy. Or the PC name now, Hansen's disease, right? Leprosy has kind of a negative connotation to it. And Louisiana was paramount to the discovery of drugs to treat leprosy um, and was the last to have a leper colony um, right outside of Baton Rouge in, in um, a little town called Carville um, in St. Gabriel uh, was the last leper colony um, in the United States. Uh, it shut down. I should know the exact date, and I don't. That's shame on me. Uh, but I worked research there in early 2000s, and um, they were they had moved the research branch previously to LSU Vet School in like the 80s, um, and then they actually shut down the facility uh, probably in the 90s, and moved the patients that were in the infirmary to a, a local hospital. But there's still about 100 cases each year of leprosy. It still happens. It's very very prevalent in um, India. Uh, there's a lot of researchers that come over from India uh, to work um, at the disease center. It is treated with um, several cocktail of antibiotics, kind of like what you, what you deal with tuberculosis. Um, and it's treated mostly now on an outpatient basis. But it's really complex. Hey, why don't you guys close the door on your way past? Didn't work. Thank you. So, um, I lost my train of thought. So there, there, um, there are, there's an uh, older gentleman, um, if he's still there, he's pretty old now, Pete, he's from the Philippines, he's a hoot. Um, he has missing limbs from the disease. He doesn't obviously have it anymore, but um, it can cause really bad deformities because it attacks the peripheral nerves. Uh, so mostly, you know, they lose limbs to secondary infection and things like that. Um, so very much like diabetic patients, they have to make sure they check their extremities, make sure they don't have any cuts or anything like that, that they didn't feel happen when they got cut because uh, of the nerve damage. We can't fix that. Um, and so Pete came from the Philippines because literally people came from all over the world to come to the center to get treatment. 
And then, of course, before we had treatment, people were literally jailed there, right, because they didn't understand how it was transmitted or any of the issues with it. It is transmitted respiratorily. The good news for the general populace is only about 12% of the population is actually susceptible to disease. Most of us, our immune system can clear it. Uh, but that's why it seems like it runs in families because obviously if someone in your family has that defect where they can't, their immune system can't kill the bacteria, then they're going to get the disease. And then if you live in the same environment as your family, one person got it, another person's probably going to get it. Um, anyone know what animal in Louisiana is a carrier? Armadillos, right? Most people know this. Did I tell you guys my armadillo roadkill story? I did. Okay, so um, so we'll talk more about that because immunologically, really kind of a fascinating disease on how it is that, you know, especially when, you know, you talk about somebody getting sick. Why does one person get sick and another person not? Well, because we differ, right? Our immune systems do differ. Um, and again, they differ based on our genetics, right? You inherit um, good or bad things, right, from your parents. So there's lots of different shapes for bacteria. Again, some prokaryotes, uh, like the archaea, do have these shapes. But again, we focus mainly on bacteria. It's what we know the most of. And especially in a human pathogens course, these are the things that make us sick. So some of them will stay together after they divide and form these characteristic groupings that we refer to as arrangements. So we'll go over all the terminology that applies to these shapes and uh, arrangements. And then, of course, you, we already know, right, what rigid cellular component helps the prokaryotes hold these specific shapes? The cell wall, right? And then I had posted some videos for you guys, right? I'm not going to take time in class, but for some of us, seeing this stuff, right, kind of animated helps in our understanding. So I highly recommend watching the prokaryotic shape animation I posted for you guys. So remember, these are three-dimensional organisms, right? So in vision for coccus, it's a sphere, right? It's a ball. It's three-dimensional. The term that we use for ones that are spherical is coccus. That's for a single cell. Cocci is plural and refers to all the spheres you see in this picture. This is Latin. This is the opposite of what most of us are used to, right? I usually means we're talking about ourselves, a single individual. In this case, this ending of I is plural. It means many. Same thing for the us. The US, that ending, typically for us, means multiple, right? In this case, it's singular, just one. So if you just remember they're opposite than what we're used to, you won't mix them up. So rods, again, imagine a sausage, a hot dog, right? Or hot, uh, Mike and Ites, or hot tamales. I love hot tamales, right? You can imagine that shape, right? And so again, three-dimensional. And these guys all vary in length. Some of them are really kind of short. Some of them are really long. And the typical term that we use for them is bacillus. But a lot of scientists just say rod. And there's, there's a reason behind that. So remember, bacillus is singular. Bacilli would be plural. And this should also, this should say, I, I had a goof and I didn't realize it. It should say genus, not species. There is a whole genus named Bacillus, right? So Bacillus anthraxis, the causative agent of anthrax, that is a species within this genus. So how would you know if someone said Bacillus, if they're talking about the shape, that they're saying that an organism is rod-shaped, or if they're talking about the genus Bacillus? Well, yeah, there's a particular way that word is written when it's a name, right? How is that written? It's italicized. It's also a genus name is always capitalized, but then again, so is everything at the beginning of a sentence, right? And, of course, the context of how someone's using that term 
will give you a clue as to whether they're talking about a shape or a whole genus of bacteria. But because of that kind of confusion, a lot of scientists like myself, we just say, when we're referring to shape, we just say rod-shaped. We don't say bacillus. Make sense? But the proper term would be bacillus. So there are some rods that are teeny tiny, almost so short, they almost look spherical. So there is a term, although I have to tell you, I don't, I've never heard it used. And I've never really seen an organism that would, I would classify as a coxobacillus. But apparently they do exist. Um, so they're really short rods. They're almost sometimes even kind of ovoid in shape. So, you know, one end is kind of bigger and the other is more tapered. And actually you can kind of see it right here. Do you see that one? And again, you know, these are three-dimensional organisms. So they kind of flip around. It depends on what angle you're seeing them at. So imagine, you know, taking um, a hot dog, right? Instead of looking at it lengthwise, look at it from the top down, it's going to look round, right? Can you imagine that? So, you know, same thing with these guys. Depending on how they're oriented in three-dimensional space, they could almost look round. But in fact, they're not perfectly circular, right? They've got a little bit of length to them. And so in microbiology lab, I always tell my students too, I'm like, does it look like a perfect circle? I'm like, if it doesn't look like a perfect circle, a perfect sphere, then it's probably a really tiny rod, right? And you're just, you're not able to distinguish that very well, right? Because we have some that are teeny tiny, right, uh, rods. It's not necessarily that they're short, it's just they're so small under the microscope. Even at a thousand times magnified, you're like, what is that? <laughs> it's so tiny. So, and again, plural would be coxobacillus. So again, because they kind of look rod and kind of look cocci, they kind of just smush the two names together, right? Coxobacillus. <laughs> Not very inventive. How would you describe this next one? A bent rod, right? So it's that rod shape, but it's got a little bend in the middle, right? This we refer to as Vibrio. Um, and uh, there is a whole genus called Vibrio. And to give you an example of a pathogenic one, Vibrio cholera, right, which causes cholera, is in this genus, has this shape, and even has, notice the little line right here, that represents... A flagella, right? So they're modal by flagella. Just a single one, a single like little propeller on a boat. But man, that's enough. Trust me, these guys can move like 60 miles an hour. They can zip. The next one, again, kind of a long rod with a whole bunch of curves to it. So this would be spirillium or spirillia for plural. And then again, when you look at the picture here, this guy has a whole bunch of flagella clustered at either end. The last one is spirochete or spirochet. And these guys are helical. Three-dimensionally, they look like a spiral staircase or a slinky. And in fact, this shape allows them to do a very unique movement. These guys can corkscrew through their environment, they like spiral through. They can do this, and you can notice in this electron micrograph, you see these black lines? Those are axle filaments. So these are similar to flagella, but they run along the outside within an outer sheath of these bacteria. And Scientists know that the shape and this movement is directly linked to those axial filaments because they've been able to engineer them to not make the axial filaments and they just end up being this long, floppy rod. They can't move. They don't hold that characteristic shape. So it's directly linked to these axial filaments. Pathogenic organisms 
that have this characteristic shape, uh, the causative agent of Lyme disease, Borella borgdifi, is a spirochete. Uh, I think trypanos, no, that's not, not trypanos. I got Chagas disease on the brain right now. Uh, apparently we have that here in the swamps of Louisiana. The kissing bug transmits a protozoa uh, disease caused by a trypanosoma is the type of protozoa. So I was like, oh, great. Like, we don't have enough to deal with, right? <laughs> I was like, I didn't even know we had that here. So, like, dogs are getting it in the swamps of Louisiana. They're getting Chagas disease. It's usually something in South America. Stuff like that. But apparently we do have it here. We have kissing bugs here. Lovely. Um, <coughs> so, syphilis. The causative agent of syphilis, I do believe, is a spirochete. And it's a T name to the genus name, and it's escaping me right now. That's okay. So again, the multiple flagella. So what structure do these cells not have, right, that have this multiple shape? They don't have a cell wall. <coughs> what term is used to describe the shape of these bacteria? Pleomorphic. Pleo meaning many morphic shapes. Right, so they don't hold a specific shape. Anybody remember the genus of bacteria that don't have a cell wall and don't hold the characteristic shape? Myco, because they kind of look fungi-like, but it's not bacteria. Those are our acid fast. Mycoplasma, right? And how I remember this one is myco, again, referring to fungi-like because they kind of stretch out right, don't hold a, a shape so they can stretch out and some, sometimes look fungi-like. Plasma, I always think of the plasma membrane, although I prefer to say cell membrane, right, but another name for the cell's membrane is a plasma membrane, right. So I think of how it just has a membrane, right. So mycoplasmas, you know, they stretch out, they don't hold their shape, right, they can sometimes look like fungi, hence the myco. Plasma referring to the fact that they don't have a cell wall, they just have a membrane. So having said that, hmm, gram stain, what would they be, positive or negative? They'd be negative because they are lacking what? Cell wall. What makes a gram positive gram positive? The cell wall trapping in that crystal violet iodine. So what are our cells if we were to stain them? Gram-negative, again, why? We lack a cell wall. Right. All right, now I'm going to trick you guys up. What about an archaea? If I stain that, would it come out gram-positive or gram-negative? It's a prokaryotic organism. They have a cell wall. It's not made. It's not made out of pentaglycan because who's got that? Bacteria, right? So chances are it'd probably be negative because if it's not pentaglycan, it's probably not going to shrink and trap it in, right? But actually, there are some gram positive and gram negative because some of those archaea have a cell wall that's very similar and acts very similar to peptidoglycan when gram stain, and they actually came out gram positive. So they have both in that case. But again, the key is there, the cell wall, and how that cell wall interacts with the decolorizer with the ethanol. In the case of bacteria, it's peptidoglycan, and it shrinks up and traps in that color. So you've got to have enough information, right, to be able to deduce. But you guys are doing a great job of using the information you have, right, to figure out right, to hypothesize what may happen. Good critical thinking skills. Okay, so let's get to some more on shapes. So remember, those are individual cell shapes we just talked about, but sometimes they'll stay next to each other after they divide. And cocci do this the most. They have the most arrangements. Um, because, again, they're spherical. So they're really not limited when it comes to three-dimensional space. They can divide on any plane, right? They can divide right next to each other in um, parallel planes or next to and adjacent to in perpendicular planes. 
or randomly, right, in all different planes in three-dimensional space. Here they're dividing all along the same plane. So sometimes they'll stay together in pairs. Other times they'll keep going, they'll form long chains. So, of course, we have terminology that goes along with this. Diplo, when they stay in pairs, right? Diplo, and again, coccyx, each individual cell is a coccyx. Streptococcus is the term that we typically use for ones that stay together in chains. And again, coccyx is referring to that the individual cells are cocci. Rods will do this too, right? So, strepto, that prefix means chain. And then, of course, the individual cells is bacillus. The problem with these guys, too, although this genus of streptobacillus has kind of been phased out, because uh, we've we gathered more information on the bacteria, they're actually getting put into different groups. But as you can imagine, most of the ones in this group were put in this group because when you looked at them under the microscope, they formed these long chains. Right? But um, a lot of the bacilli that we work with in lab, they'll form these long chains. But they're not in the genus Streptobacillus. Um, they're in the genus Bacillus. But Streptococcus, a lot of them have kind of pretty much stayed in that genus that have this characteristic shape under the microscope. So one you may be familiar with that's pathogenic causes a really bad throat infection. We commonly refer to as what? Strep throat. Guess where it got its name? The organism that causes strep throat is Streptococcus <coughs> pyogens. It's from the name of the organism. Right. So I use this as a memory thing. Right? I think of a chain, right, and how if you've ever had strep throat, even if it was when you were a kid, you probably still remember how horrific it was to try and swallow, right? So imagine that you would not want to swallow a chain, right? I always think strepto, chain, yep, I don't want to swallow it, right? That helps me remember strepto is a chain because the next one, staphylococcus, is a clustering. A lot of people confuse strepto with staphylo. And again, some of us get infections of our, our skin and they say you have a what? They say you have a staph infection. Why? Because you probably are infected with Streptococcus aureus. And they've just shortened the name of the organism that's causing the infection. And they call it a staph infection. And it can be really bad news if it happens to be a particular strain of staph known as MRSA, MRSA, which is actually an acronym for Mictilin resistant staphylococcus aureus. Mictilin is a derivative of penicillin, right? The organisms are resistant, so can we give you penicillin or a penicillin derivative? No, they're resistant to that class of antibiotics. So we got to give you something else. Anyone know what the next drug of choice was? Vancomycin. So guess what we have now? BRSA, vancomycin resistant staphylococcus aureus. This will continue. The scary thing is, what if we run out of drugs? Right? Yeah. You're like, oh, crap. <laughs> why do you think drug companies, right, work so feverishly? Right? But why we need to, as educators, which is not just me, it's going to be you, need to responsibly use antibiotics. Right? And not overuse not overexpose the bacteria population to these antibiotics and therefore greater the possibility of resistance happening. Right? If you have the flu, I'm so sorry, antibiotics are not going to help you. Right? You got to take an antiviral like Tamiflu. Right? But also by not taking the full dose Yes. By not taking your full dose, right? You feel better, right? You're like, oh, I don't need this stuff anymore. Oh no, I just mean the bacteria aren't there anymore, y'all. You need to kill all those buggies away. Because if you don't kill them all, who's left behind, it may be because, you know, they were slightly resistant and now they're mega resistant and we ain't going to get rid of those suckers. Make sense? Okay, 
So Sarcinia, not so common. Again, another one where it's a genus name, but also sometimes used as an arrangement name. These guys form very characteristic packets, uh, a cubed form of eight cells. And this is, I stole from the internet. Forget where, but you see it all over the place now. This is a cool one because it has all the cocci um, arrangements all in one slide. Right? So Diplo, remember this, Diplo refers to, what do you see here? Two, pairs. Right? Strepto refers to these cocci are forming chains. And this can be hard to see under the microscope too. Right? Um, to see that they're individually, they're chains, because they individually that they're cocci, because they kind of, like the chain formation kind of takes over and you're like, what am I looking at? And then, um, one I hadn't mentioned yet, um, arrangement called the tetrad. And anyone know what tetrad means? Four. So notice it's a square grouping of just four. Sarcinia, this is that packet, right, that cube of eight cells. And then for staphylo, it's what? A cluster, right? Almost sometimes referred to as grape-like clusters. And remember, these are going to be literally like a grape-like cluster, three-dimensional. So that cytoplasmic membrane, right, that very important barrier that defines a cell. What, what's its function? Is that it? It's a barrier, it's a line, can't cross it. It, it, it is defining the cell, right, very much so in that it determines what? What gets in and what gets out, right? We learned that term of semi-permeable, right? Not everything gets in, right? So I always like to envision, you know, those proteins that are embedded as the really evil bouncer outside the really nice nightclub, right? He's going to determine on whether you get in or not. Same thing with those proteins, right? They determine who gets in, when, how, right? They are the guardians of that membrane, the proteins. And they're also messengers, right? So you can go up to the bouncer and say, I know so-and-so, right? Please go check. I'm on the list, right? He can go carry that message. Same thing with the proteins in the membrane. Some of them are receptors or, or messengers, Right? They're like, they take a message from the outside and they carry that information inward. And that cell is going to respond just like, you know, that bouncer is going to respond based on the response that he gets. So it's not just a barrier. Right? It's a responsive barrier. It determines what gets in, what gets out, how things get in and out, how we're able to respond to the external environment. So our bacterial um, cytoplasmic membranes and eukaryotic cytoplasmic membranes differ? Yeah, but slightly, right? Not very much. So we'll talk about those key differences, and we've already mentioned one of them. So as we said, this is very delicate, actually. Very fluid, which means it's constantly what? Moving. Right? It's dynamic, it's fluid, it's moving. It surrounds the cytoplasm, it defines this boundary. As we said, it's semi-permeable. Not everything gets in and out. So water, certain gases, hydrophobic molecules can pass through by simple diffusion. What's diffusion? What determines which way it goes? Hmm? Concentration gradient, right? So if there's a lot of stuff outside, it's going to tend to want to go inside. If there's a lot of stuff inside, it's going to tend to want to go outside. <sighs> hmm. Is stuff always balanced where, like, the stuff we need to get rid of is in high concentration inside the cell, and therefore it's just going to want to go out? No, not always the case. So sometimes we've got to control this. we got to help stuff get in and out too. So this is small stuff. What about big stuff? How's that going to get in and out? 
the transport proteins in what's called facilitated diffusion. So in this case, they're helping, but we're not going across the concentration gradient typically. Active transport, though, is when we're what? We're actively going against the gradient. So what do we need in order to do that? Energy, right? Usually in the form of ATP. Right? We've actually got to expend energy. So imagine, again, that concentration gradient going uphill, right? Imagine trying to, I know we don't have many hills in Louisiana, but, you know, <laughs> imagine trying to push something uphill. You guys, most of you guys have never experienced that. I guess be glad. <laughs> Other than, like, overpasses. Man-made elevations. So again, who's going to help with that movement in the membrane for using energy to move stuff from one side to the other? It's still going to be those proteins, right? Those proteins, right, are going to what are going to help facilitate. But when we're expending energy, it's referred to as active transport. So we're not going to get into the itty bitty little details of that, right? You should have done that in biology class. For some of you guys, it may be a long time ago, so this is just a brief reminder, right? Um, so called the fluid mosaic model, right? Fluid, we've already said, it's constantly moving. These proteins are almost like icebergs floating in a phospholipid sea. They don't stay put. Mosaic refers to when we take a lot of little pieces, right, and we put together to form a much larger picture. And that's what it is. I mean, this membrane is made up of lots of little pieces, right? All those phospholipids, all these different proteins, whether it be transporters or receptors. But unlike a mosaic, right, of broken tiles you'd maybe put on a wall to make a picture, this one constantly moves. It doesn't stay put. So eukaryotes, they're similar in chemical structure, so we're still talking about phospholipids, we're still talking about proteins, we're still doing <coughs> transport, but a lot of times we've got to be able to do maintaining the integrity. We don't got to sell wall, although some eukaryotes do, right, plants do. So that difference for animals, that sterol, and even bacteria have sterols, and especially the mycoplasmas member have specialized ones to help with the problem of not having a cell wall and being a single-celled organism. For us, it's <coughs> cholesterol. For fungal cells, right, which are also eukaryotes, their cholesterol um, substance is known as ergosol. And because of this, think about pathogenic fungi, right? If you get a fungal infection. We can't give you something that would affect a bacteria, right? Penicillin is not going to touch a fungus, right? They don't have peptidoglycan, <coughs> right? We've got to try and affect something that's different from us even, right? We don't want to give drugs that are going to attack our own cells. And we're eukaryotes, right? And they're eukaryotes. So we got to find what subtle differences there are between us and them. And ergostol is one of them. There are lots of antifungal drugs out there that either interfere with the production of ergostol, therefore weakening the membranes of the growing fungal cells, or will actually um, disrupt the molecule. So again, and in this war, we want to target differences. We certainly don't want to take drugs that are going to attack our own cells. That would be a last resort. Does that make sense to you guys? All right. So where would, where, where would you find, right? Where is it located? What's its structure? How does it function? of capsules and slime layers. And again, we can help visualize these structures under the microscope. 
we can do a special stain known as a capsule stain. The capsule, unfortunately, is not a charged molecule. This layer of, of molecules, right, this chemical makeup of this layer um, is not charged. So when we stain, typically we're staining because charges are interacting with each other. In this case, there's no charge to interact with. So we can't stain the capsule. Instead, we have to stain the outside, the background around the capsule, and the cell to be able to visualize the capsule that does not get stained. So when you notice here, right, so here's the cell, here's the background, where's the capsule? Where is it? It's definitely not inside the cell, right? It's outside the cell. It's covering the cell. And if a cell has it, it's outside, of course, the cell membrane. It's outside the cell wall. It is the outermost covering of a cell if it has this extra layer, this capsule layer. Now, as you notice in these pictures, right, this capsule layer is pretty uniform, right? Nice even, round, circle, all the way around. Um, this is actually bacteria. Um, this one and this one are yeast. Right? And yeasts are not prokaryotic. They're eukaryotes, fungi, right? They're unicellular fungi. So this isn't uh, something that's unique to bacteria, although very common in bacteria because it's very beneficial to them. Think about it. An extra layer of protection. How great is that? Well, it goes one step further. It has additional functionality than just protection. So, of course, protection. And in this case, it's a very specialized protection. When bacteria get into our body and they're encapsulated, they have a capsule, it's really hard for our immune system to detect them. It's like they're wearing a disguise. Right? We don't usually have antibodies against, we've got to be exposed to it to produce these antibodies. This takes time, right? Our normal cells don't have receptors on them to detect capsules, unfortunately. So this is good news for the bacteria because they can evade detection, be protected by having this capsule layer. It also aids in attachment, right? Being able to stick to us and our cells and even stick in the environment. The difference between a capsule and a slime layer is, is their construction. So a capsule layer is usually somewhat gelatinous. It's pretty distinct, uniform, as you saw in those pictures, where a slime layer is irregular and diffuse. So what you see in this picture down here, right, it looks like tentacles. It's actually slime. The chemical composition of capsules and slime layers varies depending on the bacteria or in the case of yeast. For the most part, a lot of them are made of polysaccharides. Poly meaning what? Many saccharide sugars. Right? So sometimes it's re also referred to as a glycocalcus, calcus, calcus, ah, calcus, which basically means sugar shell. Calcix is a shell. So that's some alternate terminology you'll sometimes hear as it refers to these additional layers. So how do they move? Right? We've already seen some pictures with flagella. Right? And they're going to move in response to their environment. And for them, everything's chemical based, right? Everything is at the molecular level. So they're going to move in response to chemical signals. Chemo referring to chemical taxis movement. I always think of a taxi cab, right? Taxis means movement. So there's two animations that I highly suggest. 
The chemotaxis one on e, on E. coli, I always suggest you just watch the introduction. It's going to go down to the molecular level inside the cell. Use a whole bunch of acronyms for a whole bunch of molecules that detect <coughs> that are going to detect and determine which way the bacteria is going to move. Right? We're not going to dive down into that level. Right? We keep it at the basic level. You know, it's one of those things. If you're having trouble falling asleep, maybe watch the rest of the video. It'll bore you to death. <laughs> um, so in addition to flagella, some of them have other external papillage appendages like papillae. Um, and some papillae are specialized. Um, fimbri are specialized papillae. Um, sex papillae, as the name implies, are specialized um, for conjugation. Um, and then there is an additional appendage that eukaryotes have that bacteria do not have that's used for movement. Right? It's a very important distinction. So again, for bacteria, they got they're so small to begin with, right? And then imagine this little protein appendage sticking out of them. Not possible to visualize with our light microscopes. So there is a special staining procedure that we can use where it will attach to the flagellin protein that make up the flagella for the bacteria and make it thicker than it actually is so that we can visualize it under the light microscope. So um, for this guy, you can see that he has four flagella sticking out the end here. And what shape is this? Rod, right, or bacillus. What shape are these guys? They're rods. They're not perfect circles, right? And, and this one's really long, but you see how he looks hairy? He's covered in flagella all the way around, like scary cousin it. Okay? Covered in flagella. Uh, this is Proteus vulgaris. Um, probably got its name for the fact that when we do grow in a microbiology lab, it smells really bad. But E. coli looks like this too, right? Completely covered in flagella. It's a modal organism via flagella. So it's a long protein structure responsible for motility. It moves like a propeller does on a boat. It rotates. <coughs> it has a little hook to it. So when it rotates, right, it literally is like a propeller on a boat. And oh, I was wrong. I said 60 miles an hour earlier. These guys, if you're to clock them, some of them can get up to 82 miles per hour. Little bullets. Um, for some of them, being modal is very advantageous, right? Especially as it applies to being pathogenic. So, Helicobacter pylori um, can penetrate through the mucosal layer in our stomach, right? So, if you ingest this, it gets into your stomach. It has a way of protecting itself from the hydrochloric acid in our stomach. And then it swims right through the mucosal layer that helps protect our stomach from eating itself. Um, and then damages the lining, right, and can cause ulcers. The good news, since it's caused by a bacteria, what can we do? We can give you antibiotic treatment for it, right, if we can detect it. So they use this motility, right, and again, they're not just moving to move. They're moving because, right, something to eat over there or something is bad, so I'm going the other way, right? They're going to head towards good things like food attractants, and of course they're going to move away from repellents. But their movement isn't very direct, right? They can, and even this guy that's completely covered in flagella like E. coli would be, they'll orient all their flagella in one direction, right? And they'll spin all their little flagella, right, all their little propellers in the same rotation. Right? And so in that case, and I can never remember if it's clockwise or counterclockwise, so of course I'm not going to expect you guys to remember that level of detail. But if they spin it all one way, they can run, or they spin it the other way and they tumble. They don't turn real well. They just tumble around right? until they kind of get oriented and they're like, oh, yep, that's the right way, and they'll go for a run. When, when they're heading towards something or away from something, Right? They'll have long runs and short tumbles. 
when there isn't really a gradient, they just kind of tumble and run around, right? They're constantly on the move. So again, just like a propeller on a boat, when you turn it the other way, you go the other way, right? So they, it depends on the spin, the rotation, or whether they're going to run or tumble. Papillae, considerably shorter and thinner than flagella. So you'll see in this picture, this guy's got it all. He's got a whole bunch of these little appendages, right? Those are the papillae. He even has an F papillus or a sex papillus here. And he's got one long flagella here. What's the function? The function is attachment, right? The papillae, especially if they're called fimbri, are specialized for attachment. And of course, again, this is bad news for us when it comes to pathogenic organism. Nisiseria gonorrhea, right, ca can cause that infection, that sexually transmitted disease, because it has specialized fimbri that specifically attach to our epithelial cells. <coughs> And the bad news is they're always changing this protein structure just a little bit, right? So we can't become immune to it. We can't develop a vaccine for it. What's the good news? Antibiotics. Even better news. We do know how to get this, right? We could avoid it. And we can test for it. Right? Okay. Because... Yeah, and because that's the problem too, right? Like, oh, you know, and, you know, I got gonorrhea, no big deal. I'm just going to go get antibiotics and get rid of it, right? And then I can just do whatever I want. Well, there are resistant strains, so then you've got to take other antibiotics. So then, you know, we're going to run into the problem, again, with staff, where we're going to run out of antibiotics. You know, so just be careful about what you do in your food. You do these things, right? This one's avoidable. You don't get it from sitting on a toilet seat. You do know how you get it, right? I don't have to explain this. All right, we're good? All right. Okay, so movement, though. <coughs> These fimbri can even twitch and help them move. Uh, the, if it's a specialized sex papillus, this is going to join up two cells in a process known as conjugation. Uh, and the reason why it's sometimes referred to as bacterial sex is because they're literally exchanging genetic information. Um, and that's the same true for us. Like, sex can be boiled down to an exchange of genetic information. That's why we do it. Well, not really, but, you know. Okay, so, spermy guys, mobile DNA. Right? Mobile DNA. That's its purpose. So, am I out of time? Where am I? I was hoping to get through this. What do we got left? Uh, yeah, we'll do our best. Okay, we'll do the short version. So endospores. Some bacteria can form this very resistant form. That process of forming that, that endospore is called sporulization. And then when it comes out of that spore, it's called germination. So this sounds very much like reproduction, right? Because at one time, obviously the, study, the, student, the scientists who were studying it thought it was reproduction. It is not. These cells are going into a dormant state. They're preserving the most precious, important molecule inside their cells, which is what dictates everything that happens in our cells. DNA. Right? So they stabilize it, they protect it, they surround it in these protein layers made up of stuff like keratin. The stuff our nails and hair is fortified with in the outer layer of our skin. This is tough stuff, right? These are highly protected. The bad news for us, these endospores, right, they can get into the environment. Remember anthrax? That powder, y'all, was spores that went in the mouth. When you inhale that, it senses, oh, good environment, food. It germinates becomes that cell it once was previously. The bad news is it's a really potent pathogen. It will eat you alive, literally. Right? Tetanus. 
Those spores are all over the environment. That's why we get vaccinated against the toxin that that guy produces, because you really can't avoid it. Right? It's in the soil. Anthrax, we've done a good job in the United States of cleaning that one up. Right? You're not normally going to come in contact with spores right, in the United States from anthrax, unless somebody purposely does it. We don't vaccinate against it. That's the fear of it being used to attack us. But the key here is we can't boil and kill these guys. Most chemicals aren't going to disrupt this endospore. It's not an actively living, metabolizing cell. It's dormant. Right? It's just chilling until the conditions become good. It's already dry. You can't dry it out. It dried itself out in making the endospore. Very few radiation methods will penetrate and disrupt that DNA inside that spore coat. So again, if you watch the animations, it goes into more detail than I expect you guys to know, right? Remember to stick to our objectives. And you guys are spent, so, and we're out of time. So we'll finish the last couple objectives up next time and move on to genetics. So get your genetics brains and gear, look at the objectives, start reading, print out the PowerPoint, right? I posted it last night. <laughs>